Welcome once again to Hardware Chronicles, where we take a look at computer hardware of the past. In early 2007, the Xbox 360 was dominating the gaming space and even cannibalizing an otherwise healthy PC market, with its combination of high performance graphics, console ease of use, and affordability. By May of 2007, ATI released the Radeon HD 2900 XT, the first Radeon product to feature both a unified shader core and DirectX 10 support, half a year behind Nvidia with their 8800 GTX. As exciting as the GeForce 8800s and Radeon 2900s were, they could be as expensive as a full-blown console depending on model. Like with any other generation of graphics card, less expensive options needed introduction to fill performance and market gaps. For the HD 2000 series, that would be the Radeon HD 2600 XT featuring the RV630 GPU. Armed with 120 stream processors, a 65 nanometer process, and a blistering 800 MHz clock speed, the 2600 XT launched out of the gate with 192 G-flops of compute. Looking at the rest of the specs puts the 2600 XT squarely at 3 quarters the capability of the Xbox 360's Xenos graphics processor, also designed by ATI, which to reiterate for those who don't remember, was the first production unified shader GPU. As such, Xenos would serve as the basis for ATI's PC Unified Shader GPUs, however with some major changes. The most major change was the fine granularity of how the PC Radeon GPUs would execute code on their shader units. In simple terms, Xenos Shader Core comprised 48 shaders, each with a 32-bit scalar ALU paired with a 128-bit vector ALU. Across these two ALUs, each shader unit would accept two instructions at once, one to each ALU, while outputting five floating point operations at once, one from the scalar ALU and four from the vector ALU. By comparison, the R600 architecture replaced the 128-bit vector ALU with four 32-bit scalar ALUs for five total, along with adding a branch prediction unit on each shader. By going fully superscalar, each shader could be sent five instructions at a time, six if we count the branch prediction unit, while still outputting five floating point operations at once like Xenos. In concert, each ALU could be issued its own unique instruction, giving the new Radeons more flexibility and functionality that Xenos lacked. Where Xenos arranged its shaders in three arrays of 16 shaders each, the 2600 XT has three arrays of 40 stream processors each. Hopefully some of you have caught on to how ATI got their stream processor counts. Stream processors is the entire number of 32-bit ALUs present. They are in groups of five equaling what is effectively a shader when compared to Xenos. The previously mentioned independent control is by way of very long instruction word to control all five scalar ALUs in unison since controlling each ALU individually would have required too much added logic. Regardless, the stream processor count is valid when considering the semi-independent architecture of the ALUs, though it really had to do with marketing Radeon products as having a larger number of shaders than Nvidia. Now if it wasn't for the 2600 XT's blistering 800 MHz clock speed, it would be about half as powerful as Xenos, as the 2600 XT has effectively 24 shaders aka 120 stream processor units, 8 texture mapping units, and 4 ROPs. In comparison, Xenos main shader die has 48 shaders and 8 TMUs. The 8 ROPs are housed in the 10MB ED RAM daughter die, facilitating very fast Z-buffering, alpha blending, and MSAA. On top of that, Xenos still has access to 512MB of GDDR3 memory running at 22GB per second, though it still has to share that with the Xbox 360's CPU. Spec-wise, the HD 2600 XT is not very well matched up, but granted, in the PC space we can optimize settings for particular features, and of course the benefits of PC gaming like mods, exclusive titles, and choice of control method. Plus, the 2600 XT was only $150 US at launch, giving gamers a decent gaming experience for much less than the $400 standard price for a hard drive equipped Xbox 360. However, the 360 was extremely fast, not only against PC graphics cards, but especially for the 720p resolution it was optimized for. 
It was easily the best value in HD gaming for the first couple years of its life if we were to consider the entire cost of building a PC for the sole purpose of gaming. So I have a lot of games to show off to you all today, many that appeared in my last video with the Radeon X1600 XT, just to give you an idea of how much more capable the 2600 XT is. To save the trouble of explaining, all games were tested at 720p unless otherwise noted. Our first title is Fear, a game that the X1600 XT at 720p could only play at medium graphics settings, along with trilinear anastropic filtering and no anti-aliasing whatsoever. While it was still vastly playable, it had moments of periodic slowdown on that graphics card. The 2600 XT in comparison can be fully high settings enabled, easily with 2 or 4 times anastropic filtering at 720p. If you're desperate for anti-aliasing, it is doable, though I prefer the higher frame rates I get with it disabled. All in all, it's a generally great experience on the 2600 XT. Now moving on, as the Xbox 360's first real killer app, Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion took advantage of the 360's graphics and memory to deliver an amazingly detailed and lush open world. Suffice to say, it ate the X1600 XT for breakfast, but the 2600 XT fares much, much better. With all graphics options set to max, including HDR, but no anti-aliasing and anastropic filtering, I will mention that despite the generally very playable frame rate, there is an omnipresent judder that is most likely due to the game loading assets and from the HDD. This is a problem we could most likely mitigate with a faster HDD or even an SSD instead. Next on our list is Rainbow Six Vegas, a game purely designed around the Xbox 360, and it clearly shows in the PC port. Luckily that means it translates very well to the Radeon 2000 series, the HD 2600 XT included. Where the X1600 XT suffered dramatically, even with minimal settings at sub 720p resolutions, the 2600 XT manages 1280x720 resolution with medium shadows, low quality motion blur and HDR enabled. With a few sub 30fps moments, the experience is all not that different from playing on the Xbox 360, and it's quite enjoyable nonetheless. And this is in consideration that there are no options for changing geometrical complexity or texture resolution. In contrast to Rainbow Six Vegas, this next game was designed for 60 FPS performance on consoles, meaning that Call of Duty 4 could run fast on modest graphics cards at the time. With the 2600 XT, we can crank all the settings to their max, 720p, sans AEA, but with two times anastrophic filtering. Even this alpha blending heavy scene from the opening of the mission, Charlie Don't Surf, runs extremely well. The lack of AA is forgivable when we get very high performance much of the time and very rare dips below 30 FPS. In addition, we get a slight native render resolution advantage as the console versions of COD4 ran at 1024x600 with 2 times MSAA to hit their 60 FPS targets. So let's move on to another game that runs absolutely fantastically, Team Fortress 2. This is another game we can crank most settings to max as long as we skip the anti-aliasing and lay off higher amounts of anastropic filtering. This keeps gameplay performance fast and fluid even when the action is hot and heavy. It's not entirely surprising to see the 2600 XT run as well as it does, this is the Source engine after all, though TF2 like other Source games has seen a bit of graphics improvement since its first inception in 2007. Then we have the Juggernaut, Crisis. Crisis set a bar for graphics so high that it still looks great 8 years later. Despite that, the game and CryEngine 2 behind it are actually quite scalable. Suffice to say, the 2600 XT cannot run Crisis maxed out, or even high settings, or even medium settings for that matter. A straight mix of medium settings is too much for the 2600 XT if we want to maintain 30 FPS. However, Crisis is one of those rare games that still feels playable as long as we don't go too far below 30 FPS but if you really want to maintain it, some options will have to be set to low. At least we don't have to knock ourselves down to 480p minimum settings like I had to do with the X1600 XT. Now hard to believe it, I wouldn't consider Crisis the most difficult game to run on our complete list of games. The prize actually goes to Grand Theft Auto 4. On one hand I'm surprised, on the other perhaps I shouldn't have been so optimistic. GTA 4 simply cannot run smoothly at 720p with a mix of medium and low settings. It wasn't until I dropped the resolution to 40p and everything to low that I felt it started to output frames in what I felt was a smooth manner. The main problem wasn't as much the frame rate, however, it was the massive amount of stutter that occurred during movement about Liberty City. It could be an issue of data being pulled off the hard drive in real time, but I'm not too sure to be honest. 
GTA 4 is highly regarded as one of the worst PC ports of a AAA title in history. The 2600 XT just doesn't have the grunt, as the game is just flat out uncooperative. I'm not going to even consider this a failure of the 2600 XT, as much as it's, it's a failure of Rockstar delivering a well-optimized port. Now we come to our final game, and it's the newest in today's lineup, and thankfully it is very well optimized. That is Counter-Strike Global Offensive. As another Source Engine game, albeit a newer version of it, CSGO makes great efficiency of the hardware it's running on, however it's considerably more graphically heavy than Team Fortress 2. Because of that, we don't have a repeat of the 2600 XT, almost maxing out this game like with TF2. Instead, we must settle for medium settings, but it gives us a very good player experience, accounting for the more complicated environments and heavier effects that sometimes can bring the frame rate close to our 30 FPS threshold. By comparison, the X1600 XT I tried with CSGO could barely muster 30 FPS at the most minimum settings at 480p. These tests do represent quite well the sheer difference in capability between the X1600 XT and the 2600 XT, as they both sort of occupied the same performance space respective to other Radeon graphics cards in their product families. In conjunction, it shows how fast the performance per dollar ratio improved at such a fast rate. The X1600 XT launched close to $250 US back in 2005, while the 2600 XT launched at $150 in 2007. However, the 2600 XT's real competition was Nvidia's GeForce 8600 family of products, notably the GT and the GTS. Despite having about two-thirds the latent G-flops, in general they managed higher performance than the 2600 XT thanks to having twice as many TMUs and ROPs. Like the X1000 family before, it could be argued that the 2600 XT was future-proofed against more pixel shader heavy scenarios, but for the present was ill-equipped to handle its competition. Certainly it would have fared much better with 16 TMUs and 8 ROPs, but its lacking performance could also be chalked up to its granular shader architecture that required the use of VLIW as a method for controlling it, meaning that compiler and drivers needed to be very well written to get optimal performance out of the shaders, a problem that pursued all of AMD's VLIW GPUs up until they ditched it for GCN. Luckily the 2600 XT didn't fare as worse as the 2900 XT, which ran as hot as the GeForce 8800 GTX, while performing closer to the original 8800 GTS in most games. The 2900 XT was not a great start for ATI's first foray into DirectX 10 graphics, but the 2600 XT for its intended market could be viewed as much more successful. While it lacked the GeForce 8600's performance in most games, it did have great media capabilities by the way of its Avivo decoder and video playback optimizations. Because of this, the 2600 XT was still a common graphics card for OEM source PCs and they even used as a standard option for Apple's Mac Pro for a short while. Unfortunately, the Radeon HD 2600 XT, like its generation, is a forgettable product overshadowed by competition from Nvidia and ATI's better efforts but I still enjoyed using this video card. It provides me a clearer picture of how ATI's earliest DX10 unified shader GPUs handled the more popular games of the era, making it invaluable to me as a budding PC hardware historian. Now obviously I could test endless games with this graphics processor, but that takes a lot of time. However, I would be willing to try out a specific game if requested and I'll post results in a video. And make sure to leave a comment on your experience with the Radeon HG 2600 XT if you had one. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that like button too. Thanks for joining me today on today's episode of Hardware Chronicles. I'll see you in the next one.